Welcome everyone to Engineering Conversation. Our guest today is the medical engineer, the first one we're having on um, Engineering Conversation. Her research focuses on the wear and logical behavior of hip and knee replacements. She's a chartered engineer and a member of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers. She's currently an associate professor um, in one of the Russell universities in the country. She's a program director for one of the numerous CTD, which is the Center for Doctoral Training programs in that university as well. And she also teaches a, um, she teaches a number of medical engineering related modules for both undergraduates and postgraduate students, as well as also supervising um, doctoral researchers. She's, she also has worked within industry. She works with clinicians, biologists, biomechanics, biomechanists um, to develop models that allow to assess new treatments and intervention um, for her research area, which I'll let her talk about later. Everyone, welcome Dr. Claire Brockett to Engineering Conversation. Hi, thank you for having me. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, um, you're welcome to Engineering Conversation. Before we start today's conversation, just a few quick uh, questions. What was the last movie that you watched? I watched um, Live, Die, Repeat yesterday. <laughs> Live, Die, Repeat. I've never heard of that. It's, it's, it's a Tom Cruise film. Uh, it's, not, it's not the top normal type of film that I'd watch, but I really enjoyed it. Okay, I have to go search for it. A lion and a tiger, <laughs> which one would you choose? A lion Ooh, or a tiger? Um, well, I'm an August birthday, so technically I'm a Leo, so I'd probably have to go for lion. <laughs> okay. Um, this one, let's look more into medical engineering. If you had to design a robot, a mechanical based robot, everything is just mechanics, and then you have to um, design a re like a regenerated part, like a body part, which would you prefer? Would you prefer the, the pure mechanical robot or the regenerated one? Oh, that's, that's a tricky one. Um, I think as a sort of mechanical medical engineer, first and foremost, I'd probably find it easier to go for the mechanical, but I prefer the idea of having regenerative medicine and engineering that tries to let the body repair itself. Um, so I guess my natural tendency would be go to mechanical because that's what I could do best. Uh, but the regenerative is probably the better idea. <laughs> Okay, and then the last one, it's fun, summer is coming, we hope it's coming soon. Um, we've had snow here <laughs> back and for the past week. Chocolate ice cream or vanilla ice cream? Oh, chocolate. Chocolate. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> no question. Okay, so let's get into, thank you for your answers to those kickbackers. Let's get into today's, um, what we need to talk about. What inspired you into engineering? So I guess I'm quite like a lot of girls from a school perspective that I perhaps didn't really know what engineering was and um, perhaps didn't think it was necessarily for me. But I am quite lucky that my dad um, was a metallurgist. Mm -hmm. um, so I had some family background in, in the science. Um, but actually straight from school I worked as a cardiac technician for a couple of years. I didn't go straight into engineering. I went and worked in a hospital and did ECGs and things like that. Um, and I really enjoyed working with the patients, but I was really interested in how things work. And I think that's something that you can track back from me being like a little toddler. I was always fascinated with sort of to the detriment of my parents taking things apart and working out how things worked. So I think, um, yeah, I think that's very much what engineers do, um, understanding how things work and to make them work better. So I get to do that every day now. So I'm sort of dream job. Dream job. Do you think because you had the opportunity to go into the hospital and work with patients, that almost killed you towards medical engineering as opposed to the other engineering disciplines? 
Yeah, I think so. So, um, so I did a couple of years as a cardiac technician and got to work with doing ECGs, uh, we'd fit pacemakers, I got to learn about um, heart valves and things. So I was really interested in how that kind of stuff works. So I went off to university and did a medical engineering degree, fully expecting to sort of go into the cardiology route and get involved with, with those kind of things, pacemakers and stuff. But during my degree, I did a placement at a company called Depew, which make joint replacement. Um, and I became really fascinated with interventions to do with um, sort of moving um, and sort of musculoskeletal joint replacements, things like that. So definitely started with the idea that I was going to still do cardiology from an engineering side, but mm. completely changed my mind during a, a, a placement during my undergrad. Okay, lovely. Can you, but I know I mentioned bits and bobs of this um, when I was introducing you, but what are your research areas? I know probably, I think from way back, if I heard from cardiology and it's changed over the years to what you're currently doing. Yeah. So I got involved in joint replacement during my undergraduate degree. So I did a medical engineering degree, which at the time was quite rare. There were only sort of uh, four or five universities doing it. Um, I then was very lucky that one of my project supervisors during my undergrad had a PhD on offer, so I went straight into um, the PhD, which was around hip replacement um, and hip resurfacing. I was also really lucky with that, that I got to work with the company, so we had some collaboration and I got quite a lot of industry support and, and input into the project. Um, because Leeds is, is great, um, you might recognise I've got a sort of southern accent. I'm originally from Bedford, so I moved up north to Yorkshire for my, my original degree in Bradford and then just moved to Leeds um, and have stayed here. Um, I then did some, some research as a, a postdoctoral researcher around hip and knee replacement and I've actually moved more recently into ankle joints as well. So quite a lot of my research now is looking at trying to improve performance of ankle replacement. Um, so most people have heard of hip and knee. Uh, ankle replacement's a lot less common and at the moment less clinically successful. So there's a lot of opportunity to try and improve um, performance and improve patient outcomes. So a lot of my research now is looking at sort of ankles, how they work, the biomechanics and, and trying to make things better. A lovely um, work you're doing there with your research working ankle ankle biomechanics mostly um so the other thing that comes to mind so you are actively working in the university when people think of academia and engineering and then industry and engineering how do we how do you envisage a marriage between these two because most people think these industry academia do not work hand in hand which i have a different view of that but why are your opinions? So I think actually um, the, the idea of academia when I didn't really know what it was about put me off because I had that idea of having like being a person by myself in the corner of the lab, um, not talking to anyone, working really hard day in day out and not being able to sort of communicate and just be sort of up a corner not doing very much um, in terms of talking to the outside world. Um, and that's completely wrong. Um, I spend most of my day talking to other people in teams um, and academia works really closely with industry. We've got some really strong partnerships with different device manufacturers because uh, we need to make sure that any of the research that we're doing in our labs in the university sort of actually translates to patient benefit. So um, that partnership's really important, I think. The difference is academia perhaps sometimes has a little bit more freedom to to try things out that maybe industry doesn't have that opportunity okay. um, but yeah I mean in terms of the projects we do I can think of three different companies that we work with um, and we also have the benefit of talking to, to surgeons and patients as well so we've got everyone's input for, for the kind of research we do so it's 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 really closely aligned um, I guess the difference in academia is that alongside doing any research, I also do teaching, um, which obviously you would probably do, but in a different way in industry. Okay. 
Lovely answer to that. Um, I like the way you said that to get that final product, medical devices, which some of us may have heard of, read of, or even used it, that it's from research within universities, medical um, device manufacturers, the patient themselves, the clinicians or surgeons within our health institutions, everybody plays a part before the device is out there on the market to be used. There's also something about academia. There's also lots of information currently um, looking at women in engineering in, across different disciplines. But when we start to look at um, engineering within, um, sorry, when we start to look at women, in, women who are in engineering within UK um, higher education institutions, the number starts um, to dwindle down um, the, leaky, the leaky pipeline. What do you think has accounted for this? And what ways can we encourage young engineers, especially those that have pursued the doctorate to stay within academia? That's a really good question. Um, I'm actually quite lucky at the University of Leeds, the group we're in is fairly strongly represented by women. Um, most of our leadership in our particular research group is, is women. Um, so we're quite unusual in terms of the reflection of, of the UK. Um, at Leeds also, we've got some really outstanding female engineers. So Kath Noakes, who is on SAGE and is, is, is very prominent at the moment, um, is based in our civil engineering department. So we've got some very strong uh, women to sort of look up to and see as role models. Um, but it, it's a really good point. I think one of the issues we can see is that actually we don't have that many women coming into engineering at undergraduate level. So across sort of mechanical engineering degrees, it's only about 20% at best. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that is understandable that that then we lose some people at each stage so that then the numbers really dwindle. Um, things are changing a little bit, but really not that much. Um, so the, the CDT programme you mentioned earlier, we've got a 50-50 split of men and women on that. Um, I think we tend to see that we have more women in medical engineering um, because it has more tangible um, outputs and you can kind of see how uh, medical engineering will, will benefit. So I guess classically it kind of uh, aligns with healthcare, which is generally attracted more women. Um, but it's really hard because if we're not getting students coming in at 18 and are interested in engineering, then it's difficult to, to get them in um, via other routes. Um, whether that be apprenticeships or, or university training, I think there's a lot still to be done for, for girls sort of at school to recognise what engineering is and that it's a it's a qualification and a career that they can go on to. Um, I think that's really important. I think that's still something that we're not quite there doing yet. right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I think I think generally there is still lots of work in engineering to be done. I think what I keep saying is that the way that other industries um, promote themselves. I think engineers, we've probably taken too much of a laid back approach. So people mm -hmm. don't really understand um, either the work that we do or how, um, or even know what it is. All they know is the name, the title, um, but what exactly that we're doing, I feel like the general public sometimes is not really sure, or if they do, um, not the right um it's the wrong the wrong the wrong description of what that job looks like so i feel like the more we keep talking about what we do the better people will understand and, and also appreciate the work that we're doing um as well i agree i mean one of my one of my husband's colleagues um kind of went oh claire's not what i think of when i think of an engineer she's not got overalls and and covered in oil and it's just like that's really not what an engineer is um, and it's, it's disappointing that that's still um, the sort of go-to image for an engineer is that we're going to be 
um, covered in oil um, in an overall. Um, I mean, obviously that is a type of engineer, but the yeah. the, um, the environment's so much broader. And I think maybe that's something that we need to really try and uh, convey. Okay. Um, you have be, you have worked both in industry um, as well as in academia, and you've moved up the ranks to associate professor. I'm sure very soon you're going to be a professor. What type <laughs> of support have you um, had throughout your career that has anchored you in staying in the engineering discipline? Um, so I, I guess there's, there's two parts of that. There's one in terms of the engineering and then one in terms of staying in the university. Um, I think engineering for me is um, really about never not questioning things I think I think is as we turn into adults um there is there's a there's the ones that stay irritating and not going why why does that work um, and there's people that kind of rein that in and I'm definitely still the why why does that work to the point I probably irritate people at times um so I've, I've kind of retained that passion and I think that's never going to go away because the research I do has the potential to change people's lives. Um, now, admittedly, when I'm doing it in, in the lab at the University of Leeds, it might be 10 years before a patient gets benefit, but I can see that that link is there. Um, and I, I kind of recognise that that's really important. So I think in that respect, even if I stayed in industry, I would stay a medical engineer because I've got the opportunity to, to have quite a good impact on other people. Mm -hmm. um, staying in academia, I really like teaching, um, which is odd because at school I had to do my, like when we did speech days and stuff, I had to do my speeches from the back of the room because I didn't like people looking at me. Um, and that was almost something that put me off going into academia because I was still so scared of public speaking. Mm. Um, but actually it's something that's like any skill, you kind of develop and get more comfortable with it. I would say I still don't like it, I still get nervous, uh, but I know nothing bad's going to happen so you can kind of get through it. Mm. Um, but probably one of the things I enjoy most about the academia side of things is actually teaching new engineers and helping them develop their skills so that's a real benefit from sort of working in academia um, over sort of industry perhaps where you're, you're just working on a specific project. Thank you very much um, for that and to looking at the support systems and then also your motivation which for you sounds like it's curiosity you're always yes. curious about yes. why 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 <laughs> Yeah. Um, that has that has kept you. Um, that has been what has anchored you in your role. So, yeah. what ways? Um, this, you mentioned this a little bit earlier on, um, slightly. What ways do you think we can get more girls to start showing up um, to pursue engineering in our universities or through apprenticeships? and then also stay within engineering? So I think one of the things that is really important is obviously developing that interest and making sure that girls understand what engineering is early on. So I guess this is sort of around GCSE or even before GCSE stages so that they can choose the right subjects to, to end up there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's hard because I think when you look at the distribution of sciences at school, um, girls are going to be in the minority uh, for, for some of the, the subjects they choose even now. Um, but actually one of my experiences, so I've done some some public engagement stuff, we've been to the Big Bang Fair and, and Cheltenham Science Festival and those kind of things. And I, one of the things that really stuck with me was, um, I assume a father and his daughter turned up to, to our stall um, and he led his daughter away, but stayed with his son and said to her, oh, engineering's not for you. Despite the fact that everyone on the stall at that time happened to be female, it was kind of, it was just that way. Um, so I think it's really important that as well as in sort of engaging with 
uh, girls to get them interested in engineering is actually helping um, parents or guardians or, or even teachers understand what engineering is as well so that they get that support because I think it would be very difficult even the most sort of um, focused student say from I don't know the age of 13 onwards it would be very difficult I think for them to pursue and stay interested in engineering if they're not getting support or encouragement through other routes so if the teacher doesn't really understand engineering they might steer them off in another direction likewise parents or guardians might sort of go well are you sure you don't want to I know you're interested in medical engineering but are you sure you don't want to become a doctor um, that kind of thing um, so I think it's equally as important to, to do the kind of stuff that you're doing which is actually sort of raising the profile and saying well actually engineering is is this it's not just this little bit and, and lots of people can do it. I think the other thing is that engineering isn't hard. Um, there's a there's a bit of a perception that engineering can be quite difficult. Um, and there's a, I think one of the things that is really important is actually, it's kind of a, a way of thinking and an approach. I, I mean, I've obviously sort of done, done well at um, de degree and PhD, but on a day-to-day -day basis, I think, I think the problem solving and the sort of personal skills in terms of committing to things and keeping on trying and, and, and not getting knocked back when things go wrong mm -hmm. is as important as any academic talent. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, obviously there are lots of TV programmes like um, Brian Cox and that kind of thing that is making science more accessible generally. Mm -hmm. I think an equivalent sort of thing to go through engineering would be really beneficial. Hmm. I like what, um, I like two points that you said, getting from these guardians curious also to understand um, what engineering is about. I think I've had, um, I think it was last year, I had two ladies that were on the show that had said um, their families initially did not support them when they decided that engineering was the route that they were going to go into it was when they had finished um person had working that was it took that long for their families to appreciate the work that they were involved in initially it was more or less like yeah girls engineering is not it's not for you and i feel like in 2021 we should have at least moved past that um meaning that our outreach is not just to the young ones or even the girls but also to the families and then the second thing that you said that I love is that engineering is not hard. Um, because there's this, no, <laughs> because there's this perception about certain things being harder than others. And mm -hmm. in my opinion, if that is the route that we all want to go to, everything is hard if you yeah. don't put the effort in it. So whether, I, I don't know, like whether it's medicine, whether it's art, whether it's um, being a geologist is all equally hard mm -hmm. if you don't put the effort in. But if you are consistent, you persist through it, it becomes easier and easier with each step. But with that perception being there that is hard, already people start getting these mental blocks that, oh my God, engineering is hard. So already there's that stumbling block before you even try and attempt or get into it. So um, I think I think that's a really good thing that you said. Everything we actually need to work towards. We actually need to work towards it. Um, so moving on, how important would you say work-life balance is to an engineer? You can personalize this to your own self <laughs> or your own experiences. So I think because um, engineering is problem solving um, fundamentally if we take away whether it's a, a plane a body part whatever it is we're, we're trying to make things perform better or solve problems that does take quite a lot of um, cognitive capacity you do need to have that space to be able to think about things and I think sometimes if you get your work-life balance wrong and spend lots of time working and don't have the rest for your brain just to switch off then actually that can impact on your ability to to be creative in how you're thinking about things for me i found this last year quite difficult because um the university shuts um 
mid-March last year. Um, so I've actually not been into my office for over a year now. Uh, so this is this is my my house. Um, I've taught online from my house. I've been doing my research meetings from my house. Um, and I used to have a half hour train journey into work and home from work. So the half hour into work would be me opening my phone and looking at my emails and the agenda for the day. And the half hour going home would be reading a book and switching off. Um, and I don't have that anymore, which means that I kind of roll out of breakfast straight to work. Um, and then if I've got stuff to do, I just keep on doing it because there's not that, oh, I need to catch a train to get home. Um, so I've had to really make some effort in the last year to kind of have some stop and start times um, to make sure that I actually switch off. Fortunately, I've got a separate room for my office space. So it is kind of, I can shut the door and works in there and the rest of my house is home and, and fun. But um, it's really important, I think, um, there's a lot of um, positivity, I guess, around working hard. There's quite a lot of, oh, I work 50 hours a week or I work 80 hours a week and look how hard I work. And I don't think that's positive. I think um, number of hours work doesn't necessarily translate to good performance. Um, but also I don't think that's good for everyone's well-being and I think it suits other people so I'm I have ideas around my research quite a lot of the time so my husband laughs at me I've got a notebook that's in my handbag wherever we go because sometimes things should pop into my head um, but I try not to work weekends unless I've got like a major deadline or something I try to keep that as my time and, and that works well that gives me enough downtime to have creative thoughts when it comes to coming back to work and thinking about the problems that I'm trying to, to solve, whether that's how to teach better online or or whether it's trying to solve how to set up a, a simulator or a bit of kit in the lab. Okay, that's really interesting, um, your take on work-life balance. I think one of the things the pandemic did for everybody was that I think nobody ever thought that we would be working from home for such long periods. So I think it threw everybody off their game. And it was like, okay, we're going to start working or we need to be working. And I think the first few months was generally hard for everyone. And then I think just to get people's mind of the pandemic and things around them, sometimes you'd work past your end of day and you don't even realize it. And then at some point you realize, oh, this, I need I need some me time for myself and then being intentional to make sure that okay a five or a four work end afterwards I need to take care of me or whoever my interests are um, and I hope that when when this pandemic is over um, we don't go back to some of um, we all don't go back to some of the work, the bad working habits where we are like praising the, I'm working 1 million hours a week, um, those sorts of behaviors. But like you said, if there's like a, a big deadline coming up, then okay, we might put in those extra hours, but we don't go back um, glorifying excessive hours and attributing that to um, good work being done. Mm. Yeah. So one of the things, Looking at your re the research that you're doing, um, teaching that you're doing, you are obviously a really, really busy person. What do you do outside of work, outside of engineering, that most people will be quite surprised to see you involved in? Um, you can consider we don't have a pandemic and you can be out there by yourself. What would that be? So there's a couple of things. So at the moment in the pandemic, I have joined a choir on Zoom, um, which is really interesting. So we're all on mute, so you could only hear yourself singing and then we've got a backing track. So I do that that once a week. So that's really nice because it's very different. Why um, is everybody's microphone on Zoom um, on mute? Because I think when you sing together, it all goes out of phase slightly. Oh, okay. So it probably sounds dreadful. <laughs> <laughs> 
so I was just sort of sitting here happily singing along to myself. I feel like I would want to hear someone at least, not just necessarily yeah. my own voice. Yeah, it is harder because actually when you're in a, a choir, you obviously can hear everyone around you. So sometimes that helps you get your note. Um, but it, it's nice. It, it's kind of getting together with, with people online and, and sort of being a little bit sociable. Um, the other thing that I do and I've done since I was about 14 is I'm an archer. I like doing archery. Um, I've not obviously done it in the last year, but with everything opening up, I'm hoping to pick my bow up again in the next few weeks and start shooting at a target. <laughs> oh, but that's interesting. That's really interesting. Um, so that technically brings us to the end of um, this engineering conversation. Um, Claire, I want to say thank you very much um, for sharing your educational as well as your engineering career both in academia and when you were in industry. Um, we do appreciate you sharing that as well as the work that you're doing, um, researching on uncle, um, Uncle Biomechanics, which is probably going to come out in the next few years, um, especially looking at some of, um, when you start looking at healthcare and the aging population, and then also with teaching um, the next set of medical engineers that will help make our healthcare systems more robust with some of the products that they're going to come up with. So thank you um, for, imparting the knowledge that you have gained on into these students coming up and then also with your research thank you very much thank you for having me it's been lovely talking to you you're welcome <laughs>